welcome everybody to today's live stream. Um, this is our first live stream of the season. It's called Geological Time Travel Through the Connecticut River Basin. We're so excited to have you all here today. My name is Stacy Leonard. I'm, I'm the events manager here at Connecticut River Conservancy. Our featured speaker today will be Fred Venn, who's the museum educator at the Beneski Museum of Natural History at Amherst College. Fred is gonna take us on a time travel, leading us on a watershed, watershed wide journey to explore the geological history of this Connecticut River Valley. Fred will share major events that shape the watershed, as well as present day river and land environments and conditions. Fred is also a science education consultant in both formal and informal settings. In his role at the Beneski, Fred connects the public with the resources of the museum. And I'd like to add a personal note that I've had the pleasure of experiencing several of Fred's talks live at the museum, and I'm really excited to share him with our online community today. Uh, following Fred will be uh, CRC's own river steward in Vermont, Kathy Erfer. Kathy will discuss the human-induced impacts that CRC is responding to through our restoration work, such as the impacts of hydropower and flooding. Before we go turning over to Fred, a couple of housekeeping details as usual. Uh, we're, we've saved time at the end for lots of questions and answers, so please type them in the chat when you think of them, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. And we also ask folks to please stay muted during the presentation, but when we come to Q&A, we'll be able to let people ask questions as well. We are recording this episode and we'll share it uh, with everyone who registered. We'll get the link later today or, or by tomorrow. And um, I will be sending out an email with lots of resources and other ways that you can connect with CRC's work and with Fred as well. So without further ado, Let's turn it over to Fred. Welcome. Well, well, welcome, welcome to the Connecticut River Valley. But um, I thought I would start um, by giving you a. Actually, I'll tell you what I was doing this morning. Every morning I go out for a run, and I go out for a run usually around you know six six thirty in the morning, and I head for a couple different routes. One route is this three and a half mile loop that runs along the the Mill River which feeds into the Connecticut in Northampton. So I was out this morning, I ran, you know, about, you know, five kilometers, give or take a little bit up the river. And what struck me is as a running along this little tributary that runs into the Connecticut was how many dams are still located on the river. It was just, it was, you know, and because I knew I'd be chatting with you all today and I'm thinking, you know, what does the river really look like? Three or four dams, I think it was four dams that I witnessed over a, a like a, four or five mile run, which is quite impressive. Um, all of which have been in some way, shape or form actually dismantled a little bit. So the water's able to run through them, but um, still, you know, I'm thinking of some of the restocking efforts that have been done further up the Mill River, uh, things like salmon, and can't imagine how a salmon would be able to leap their way back up um, with some of those dams that are still existing. Just kind of a fun fun note. The other um, couple quick things about the river itself and, and me is that, uh, as a as a young person, I I spent a fair amount of time swimming. I was a you know fairly you know avid swimmer, and had the liberty to swim across the Connecticut River, um, you know pretty much where the Calvin Coolidge Bridge is located, you know between Northampton and Hadley. Now, in a daily on a daily basis, I actually have crossed in the past decade. I probably crossed the river upwards of maybe five, six thousand times. Um, so I get a chance to see it, you know, every day and see it. Ch it's changing how it looks from day to day. Probably most importantly, though, is I've actually had two opportunities to actually go across the river, um, not with a car, but actually across the river itself. Once was literally, you know, in a boat, you know, kind of going across the river. I went to swimming. Actually, there's three times once by boat, once, um, you know, you know, literally driving over it. But also importantly, I walked across the river once. Now, I don't walk on water. I try to think that I can walk on water. But there was a time, you know, some 50 years ago when we were, when you could walk across the Connecticut River when it was frozen in the wintertime. And I did make, make my way across several times, you know, during one winter. Um, to quite a, it was quite the, it was quite the thing to do when you're, you're young is to kind of walk across the river. 
that being said, I just, you know, thought it'd be kind of interesting to kind of get a sense as to, you know, the river is really an important part, you know, of my life. And it's nice to be able to kind of share back a little bit today. So if we can switch to the first slide, we're going to begin to look at, you know, and, and we're going to do several of these slides quickly, just get a look at the river kind of heading from north to south. And the next slide, um, again, it's kind of wonderful to see some of these old, you know, covered bridges, you know, across various parts of the river. And the next slide. I think we go in the other direction, we'll probably get there. There we go. And, and the next one. And what, I love this particular slide because it's got wonderful meanders. I mean, as you're looking at it, and we'll look at this in more detail, but the, the meanders are amazing. Here you can see the, you know, where, where the right river kind of joins the Connecticut. And then the next slide. Um, again, just beautiful images of, you know, you know, a close up of the Connecticut, which you don't get to see very often. And the next slide. And the next one, and the next one, and the next one. I'm not sure why they're repeating, but that's okay. Isn't that bridge amazing? Yeah. And the longest existing bridge across, you know, that's still covered you know, across the, the Connecticut. And the next slide. So this is where we're going to start. So now we're going to go back in time. We're going to go back in time some 600 million years, maybe even more to kind of get going. So what's probably most obvious, even in the image that's here, is you know there's a lot of things that are wet. There's a lot of water, um, and we're long before the Connecticut River. We're just going to begin. So our next slide is going to take a look at um, kind of a very quick overview of kind of the geology. So what you see to your left is a map of the geology of New England, and what you see to your right are the mountain building events that are responsible for that geology. So we're going back upwards of a billion years to the very early mountain buildings events, to, you know, more recently, more again, everything's relative, more recently, 250 million years ago, where things begin to break up and create the, the valley that we know today. So if we move on to the next slide, we can, can begin to kind of look at what the five phases might be. So we're going to really look at five important things. First and foremost, after the land was kind of mushed together and mountains were being built, there was a time when the land split apart a bit and there were shallow inland seas, followed by additional mountain building events, further followed by rifting. Um, rifting is really just much, uh, probably the best way to describe it is the land is kind of pulled apart. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, erosion, notice that erosion, huge, 170 million years of erosion. Um, and finally, what the valley looks like today. And if we go on to our next slide. So we're gonna start with kind of, you know, you know where things are. I mean, if you think a billion years ago, we had a proto North America. So if you look at the map that's to your left, we're talking about everything to the, the left-hand side of what's red, which is the Grenville belt and the Grenville sequence. Everything to the left is kind of what existed and everything to the right didn't really exist. But the Grenville mountain building event is what really kind of set the stage for some of the, the, the larger Appalachian type mountains, at least in the northern, you know, the northeastern part of the country. Um, and if we go to our next slide, we're going to focus on a period between 540 and 400 million years ago for a moment, which is a period of shallow inland sea. So that first mountain building event created, you know, the mountains that are to our west. And then the land split apart a bit. And when the land split apart, and what are we talking about? We're talking about, oh my goodness, um, the split up of something called Rodinia. I know it's not something we're familiar with. We probably know terms like Pangaea, but Rodinia was this continent that was beginning to pull apart. And as it did, um, the land pulled apart, water would fill in, and it created these shallow areas of water. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, and the kind of the the evidence that we had shallow water is what you see here. So across the top, you see a sea star, sponges, and shelled creatures. These are living creatures that live today. Those images were taken literally, you know, within the last couple of years. However, the images below are images of fossils of those same critters. The fossils that you see that run across the bottom were all found in a faraway place called, um, well, Upper State New York. Um, and you think, why in the world would you find you know, fossils in the mountains of Upper State New York. Well, just to briefly kind of explain it, and, and I know my image is small here, but I'm going to, kind of, you know, I don't know how well you can see me, but I'm going to use my hands to help demonstrate something here for a moment. So you can imagine this is a continent. My hand represents the continent, and this would be the continental shelf. 
Well, the continents were beginning to move together. And as two continents move together, the two continental shelves butt into each other, which creates a shallow inland sea between these two continental shelves. Once you have a shallow sea, light can penetrate from above. And when light can penetrate from above, you can have life take root, you know, the beginning of some kind of plant. So you have plants that begin to grow where the light is able to penetrate in the shallow sea. And as the life begins to take root, you have little critters that begin to make their way around, like sea stars, like we see in the images here, or sponges, or brachiopods, things that begin to kind of eat, and eventually they die, and they get buried with mud. More of them live, they die, and they get subsequently buried with mud. And it happens again and again and again. And as they're dying and getting buried with mud, at the same time, these continents are moving together. How fast are they moving? Well, they're moving about the speed that your fingernails grow. So think about how often you have to trim your fingernails. It's about a cent, your fingernails grow about one centimeter a year. So it's pushing together at the rate your fingers grow. And as that's happening, all those little sea critters that were living and dying are getting smushed in the muds. And as they get smushed into the muds, that compression, one of these two continents is going to win and one's going to lose this battle. And as one wins, it might drive up over the other one and the other one gets driven down. And the one that's driven up ends up having all these little critters that were embedded in, in, the, in the sediment into the matrix and are being pushed up as rock, sedimentary rock, which have in them the fossils that we see in the lower part of our image here. Where are they found? Just to our west a little bit. Again, strong evidence that you had shallow seas. Um, and I mentioned that locally. In a broader, kind of thinking it more broadly in terms of the, the Earth, an area where it's more recent that you've had a, a continental collision of that nature. I mean, here, we're talking about 400 million years ago. It's a long time ago. But as recently as 50 million years ago, the continent, of, the subcontinent of India collided with the Asian continent and they had the same situation happen, smushed and created the largest mountains that we have in the world right now, which are the Himalayas. And on top of the Himalayas, there's a suture line where you can see where the two plates came together and you can actually see the fossils. You have seafloor fossils on top of the Himalayas. I mean, we're talking 30,000 feet up, you have seashell fossils. Not unlike what we had happening just to our west in what would be, you know, the, the Appalachians, the, low, the beginning of the Berkshires and up into the Appalachians. And if we go to our next slide, um, it gives you kind of a picture of what the seafloor would have looked like at the time. So there's a kind of a close-up of what it might have looked like in the critters that were living at the time. And then to the right, a couple more examples of critters that, you know, like the crinoids, um, commonly referred to as sea lilies, um, kind of float about and they filter feed. They're kind of attached to the ground and they kind of filter feed. Um, and the fossils are just beautiful fossils from Ohio, the ones that we have in this particular image. And then corals. Now, the coral that you see, you know, that the brain coral, which is a modern coral, um, is the live coral that's to the left. And the coral to the right would be, again, a fossilized coral that was found up in the, you know, just, just to the west of the Berkshires. Again, evidence that the seas were quite shallow. And if we go on to the next slide. So here, um, so you've got you know, I, I kind of highlighted, you know, three events. So you've got the tectonic mountain building event, the Acadian mountain building event, and the Allegheny mountain building event. Um, and I thought there was some arrows that came in with this. Maybe hit one more button. We'll see if it... Nope, that's okay. We can come back. So I guess the best way to describe this is if you you look to... We talk about the tectonic. Let's do. Let's start with that one. I note that it's Japan-like. So, what does that mean? If you think Japan and Mount Fuji, um, Japan is a, 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 an island arc of volcanoes, and it's an island arc of volcanoes because what's happening is there's an ocean plate that's driving into a continental plate. It's getting driven down, and as it's driven down, it melts this material, and then it kind of seeps up and then forms these volcanoes here. Even though you have continents, you have a volcano island arc and you have the main continent here, which would be where China is. And that whole area eventually over time would get completely smushed together, which is what happened here. So what we have, the tectonic mountain building event, which is the Bronson Hill material. And if you're looking at the coloring, it's kind of that purpley color, the dark purple, that got created and smushed. So that's basically the old volcanics that got kind of smushed together. The next big event was the Acadian mountain building event, which is going to be the, the lighter purple. 
Um, and that's another accretion, another you know mountain building, that, and another piece that's kind of melded on. And then finally, more re the most recent of them was the last one where the mountains were coming in, were the Alleghenies. And the Alleghenies would be to the south. So if you look at the area south of the pink, um, that would be the you know the Allegheny mountain building event, which is going to be part of the Appalachians. And I apologize, my arrows didn't come up on my slide. I do apologize for that. Um, if we go to the next slide, what happens during a mountain building event? Well, um, the chart over to your right shows kind of what happens with rock material that's put under heat and pressure. And the heat and pressure is a function of depth. So the further down into the earth something is driven, um, the more it will change because it gets hotter and it be, it's put under more pressure. So different things happen to minerals that you know are being put under heat and pressure. So if you take all, remember our plates coming together and one got smushed down and the other one got smushed up, this one that got smushed down, that got subducted. All as right, I'm leaving. Um, you don't want to help me pick some stuff up. Uh... I'm sorry? I think somebody... So as it was subducted, as the plate was subducted, it was pushed down deep. And what happens is the material that was collected, all that mud and all those shelled material, it begins as it's pushed down, different minerals will melt at different temperatures. And as they do that, they will begin to basically, they they will begin to kind of align and they become the minerals, you know, almost become you know, layered in some way. It almost looks layered, not truly layered, but you can see the two rocks that I use for an example at the bottom here. One is a, you know, kind of a granite and the granite is then put under heat and pressure. And you can see the one to the right of it, you see the alignment of the minerals. The minerals have been kind of, they melt at, you know, different temperatures and they begin to align as they melt. And they do the same as they cool. So it allows, it, it, there's a change. There's, these rocks are going through metamorphism. And that's one of the big indicators that we've had some kind of huge mountain event. And our next slide. So, so just to, you know, what was going on is Pangaea was forming. So all the continents were coming together. Again, all the continents, you know, have been in different places and now they're kind of coming together to form a supercontinent, the great continent of Pangaea. And the image that you see, it kind of shows kind of where we were. So if you look to the West, you can see that, you know, it's, there's a continent to the West with some shallow seas. Um, we're located at where some mountains were built, you know, that Grenville mountain building event, some 1.2 billion years ago. And then to our, you know, to our east, you've got some deep, deep ocean that's beginning to close up a little bit. And if we go on to our next slide. So here's some of the impacts of that. And I, th I think it's helpful to see all these images together. So the, the picture in the upper left-hand corner is an image of it's actually a rock in our collection. It's a large piece of marble from Vermont. And the marble from Vermont, you can see, you can just look at that particular image and you can see that this is something that's been squished. Now I know it's hard to see this for scale, how big this is. This rock is about, about three meters long or about 10 feet long and about two and a half feet high. And it literally weighs over a ton. And it sits on the second floor of our museum and it, it just screams it's been squished. And you can tell the direction it was squished because we just look at the way it's been folded and bended, or bent, I should say. And then you can also see the layering effect that, that um, you know, what, what we call, you know, again, it's not so much layering, but it would be, it, um, I'm, the, the word escapes me at the moment, but this metamorphic rock is, you know, one of those rocks that would have been found in the mountains of Vermont. And if you look to the map to the right, you can see the Appalachian chain and where it would be. And then all the mountains that are part of the Appalachians, you know, are kind of listed there, the Catskills, the Green Mountains, the White Mountains, the Berkshires, and so on. Oh, the term, I just wanted to know, finally came back in. So the term associated with this mineral alignment that gives you that light and dark, light and dark is foliation. Um, and that's what you see with metamorphic rocks that have been put under tremendous heat and pressure. Continental collisions create these rocks. Um, our next slide, please. So we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit here, and we're going to go to our most recent major event, which is going to be the breaking up of Pangaea some 250 million years ago. Um, again, my, 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 my arrows didn't show up. That's, 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 it's, um, so, so I'm going to tell you where the arrows were, because <laughs> if you look at the map to your left, um, there's an area that's kind of whitish gray down, down toward the bottom. 
So it's between kind of the yellow and the purple, the darker purple. That area is what would be the Connecticut River Valley from about Greenfield down to the Long Island. That area was get is basically being torn. The, the land was being torn apart. It was tearing apart um, all over the place, many places. So as the land was splitting apart, um, it's just hard without those arrows. So it's um I apologize again. So let me let me put it this way. So the um the continents on the earth are always moving. Sometimes they move together, sometimes they move apart. And as they move apart, um, they move apart because they're the land is under pressure, and the pressure comes from the inside of the earth. Um, where the inner part of the earth, with the very inner part of the earth, is the core, and the core, because it's you know the earth is comprised of all this matter that's been that basically is pulled together by gravity. It creates a tremendous amount of pressure inside the earth, so much pressure, so it's incredibly hot, and that ha that heat has to escape somehow. So the heat from the inner part of the earth moves from the inner core to the outer core through something called conduction, which is basically heat contacting, you know, molecules contacting other molecules, transferring the heat through the inner, through the outer core. Eventually it reaches this very, very thick layer of the earth called the mantle. When it reaches the mantle, the heat does, it begins to move the mantle in what's called convection. So we, we kind of convection ovens, we kind of know how convection works. So the molecules get up warm, heated up, and then they separate, the, the material becomes less dense, and it moves almost like a, like a Play-Doh kind of material. As it moves, it begins to bring that heat up toward the surface, and you have on the surface of the Earth is the crust. And the underlying crust is, is driven by that heat to begin to move apart. And sometimes if there's a lot of pressure, the crust will begin to move apart. And as it does, it'll crack in many places. One of the major cracks that happened near us is where the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is, which would be kind of where Boston is. And it began to cr it cracked and it split at that location. And Europe and Asia moved off in one direction. North America moved off in the other direction. And the ocean filled in in between. Well, while that crack was happening and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge was opening at about a centimeter a year, there was a crack that occurred right where we are, in the, which is the Connecticut River Valley. It cracked here, it cracked, but it failed to rift completely. And as such, the land kind of broke and dropped out, creating the valley that we see today. So if we go to the next image, it'll begin to kind of show some of what was going on there. So actually, it's, this is a funny, so this is an image of that rifting happening literally today at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, at the critical point. This is an image from Iceland that a colleague of mine took when they were, you know, they had a, a, a basically a field trip out to Iceland with a group of students. But you can see that the earth is literally cracking open. That area that you see in this picture is kind of the, the critical point for the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in Iceland where everything splits from. And then it splits all the way down through the Atlantic. And our next image has a couple of, um, so here there's some fault diagrams that kind of explain what's going on here. So you can see in the first diagram to the left, um, the land is pulling apart and the asthenosphere is being stretched, and you can see all the breaking that's occurring, which is the Connecticut Valley border fault. And then the land is pulled apart more, and you can see it breaks apart a little bit to the east, which is going to eventually be the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and to the west, you still have the Connecticut Valley border fault, which is where we are. And then the third shows the image of the asthenosphere pulling apart, and then you can see the you know beginning of you know magma rising up into the crack filling the crack and the land splitting apart at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And you still see to the left, the Connecticut Valley border fault, which is what we have today. And then finally, the last image shows what things look like today with the you know, Mid-Atlantic Ridge kind of pulling completely apart. Um, and if you were to measure, which is interesting, if you measure the distance from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge to Boston, it would equal approximately the amount of time that it took for the ridge to open up. How long? Well, this is happening 200 million years ago. If you take 200 million years, multiply it by one centimeter, the growth of your fingernail, you'll get approximately 1,500 miles just to you know, ballpark it. The ocean at that area is about 3,000 miles about. So it's about 50, it, 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 the multiplication actually works. So it's you know 200 million years times a centimeter or times about a half an inch. So it's 100 million inches, which equates to about 1,500 miles, which is kind of fascinating. But what we're focusing on is to the left of that, which is the Connecticut River Valley border fault, which is to the west. 
And in the right hand side, what you see are a couple images that are, you know, uh, images that actually artist work, artist, the artist was Will Sillen, who did all of the artwork for the Vineski Museum, as well as for Dinosaur State Park and others. You see a couple of images of what the area looked like at the moment that the valley was opening up. Um, we're going to go to the next one. So this is kind of a close-up view of what the Connecticut River Valley looked like some 200 million years ago and what the, you know, what life looked like. Um, and the evidence for what you see here is in the rocks that you can actually have access to today. I mean, if you go down along the Connecticut River, you can find, you know, fossils that will actually help us to understand that the kind of plants we see in the environment that's here and the kind of animals we see existed at that time. So the next slide should begin to bring in some of those images. So what we're seeing here, the slide that's furthest to our, our to your left at the top are ripple marks, which indicate that there was water moving back and forth, just indicative of what the environment was. The one to its right that looks like little pit marks is actually raindrop impressions, um, raindrop and or hail, indicating, again, an environmental condition. Those two, the ripple marks and the raindrops, are important climate indicators. And let me explain that very briefly. If you are able to capture rain in the mud, you have to have a certain kind of rain. I mean, imagine you have rain that hits the mud, kind of go making little impressions in the mud. Well, they would sit there if it didn't continue to rain. If it continues to rain, all of that mud washes away and you lose that evidence. But this, these mud impressions have to be, it has to be a, a very quick rain shower, just a sudden, you know, the kind of Boom, the clouds open up, the rain comes down, makes the impressions, and then the, then the sun comes out, it gets really hot, dries the mud, and lets it sit. Not for, not for a day, not even for a week, maybe six months through an entire dry season, which allows the mud to harden. Also, all the microbial material that would have been living on the mud dies, creating a kind of a dead microbial mat, almost pasting together that sediment in a way that it helps to protect it so that when the next wet season, the ensuing wet season comes in, the muds come down, fill in all the nooks and cranny, crannies and preserves that. This is indicative of wet dry seasons, as would be the image to the left, which are the, the mud, the, the, the ripple marks. 136. Wow. When you have wet, wet and dry seasons, um, you're talking about a very different kind of a different kind of environment than we have today. Um, today, you know, we have four seasons. At that time, they had two. We had two seasons. You might ask why. There's two major reasons why. You know, two trigger events that you know dictate the season. One is at this time, Pangaea was just splitting apart, so we were on the far side of a continent with the beginning of a sea that was building in. So we we were in a pretty dry area. And number two, we were located at about 18 degrees north of the equator. Think the um, think the the Florida Keys. That's kind of where we were located, and we've moved over the last 200 million years. We've slowly moved north up to where we are now, which is at about 42 degrees north of the equator. The other images that are here, you can see a beautiful plant fossil, you know, fern from this area, um, and the other two have some dinosaur tracks in them um, that can be found in and around, you know, the Connecticut River Valley. I mean, th these are what we find. It's evidence that we had critters walking around in those muds. So the next slide, please. So here, you know, we, we ended with this huge rifting event, which created um, a major part of our valley. Um, we, you know, the mountains were still, the mountains that were to the east of us, you know, those are eroding a little bit. The mountains to the west are eroding and they're bringing all the sediments down into the valley. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, we're talking a period of nearly 170 million years from the time the valley was finished forming to when we see pretty much what we see today. So what's going on? We have mountains to the east and the west. These mountains are not small. They're tens of thousands of feet high. As such, you know, as they erode, they bring that debris down into the valley. You know, all the big clunky debris is kind of at near the edge of the mountains. And then the finer sediment is brought into the bottom of the valley where the muds collect. And you've got muds and conglomerate. All this material just keep piling up and up and up and up. up. And literally over time, the valley that was formed when the area rifted apart is completely filled with sediment. So there's sediment on the bottom of the valley that's been compressed by the overlying sediment. 
And we're talking about a mile depth of sediment. So you've taken kind of muds and sands and gravel and you smoosh them, but you haven't put, in, put them so deeply that you're remelting them. You're smooshing them. You're lithifying them into a new stone, into a sedimentary rock, um, like sandstones and conglomerates that are being compressed at the bottom. And then as you make, make your way further and further to the more recent material on the top, it's less and less compacted. Um, erosion continued for literally tens of millions of years until erosion stopped. This is really important. Erosion stopped because once the valley was full and it became a pinna plain, there was nowhere for, you know, rocks to go. You have to have an up and a down. Without an up and a down, you can't have erosion. So sub subsequently, this entire region, the New England region, was uplifted north to south. And if we can go to the next slide, as it was up uplifted north to south, um, you began to have erosion picked up again. So erosion picks up. It begins to move the materials from north to south that were in the valley. Again, think about the valley has loosely packed material on the top. That erodes out pretty quickly. The mountains that are to the east and the west, which are the old, you know, uh, metamorphic mo mountains that are kind of hard, resilient, they erode, but not quite as quickly as the soft, loose stuff in the valley. So little by little, the entire region is eroding away and eroding away and eroding away and eroding away over the, the subsequent tens of millions of years until we get about, oh, to a point about two and a half million years ago, when pretty much all of the, the majority of that material has been eroded out of the valley, and the valley is now opened up. And the mountains to the east and the west, they, they were eroded down to pretty close to what they are presently, you know, give, give or take a little bit, you know, you know, in the thousand to two thousand foot range, depending upon where you are in our valley. So you've got all this, you know, this hard, resilient rock to the east and the west, the soft stuff that's in the middle that got eroded out. And then finally, and if we go to the next slide. Finally, the last major event to occur is another cyclical event, a cyclical weather event, and this was um, glaciers. So we had glaciers that came, we had a, an ice age. So about 2.4 million years ago, an ice age began. Very briefly, what kicked off the ice age was, it was astronomical. Um, the earth, which kind of tilts a little bit, well, the earth tilts a little, it wobbles over time and it tilts a little extra periodically. And when it tilts a little bit away from the sun, it gets a little colder. The Earth also orbits in a in a in a in ellipse, which is kind of like an oval shape around the Sun. Sometimes that ellipse gets stretched out a little bit, and we get a little bit further away from the Sun, and that makes the Earth get a little bit colder. And finally, the Earth goes around pretty much in a flat plane. But every once in a while, the Earth kind of gets kicked out of that plane a little bit, um, and when it does, the Earth gets a little bit colder. When those three cycles come together in a periodic time period, it actually kicks off an ice age. And an ice age is really nothing more than it gets colder, water evaporates off the oceans, and it comes down as precipitation comes down as snow, and evaporates, comes down as snow, evaporates, snow, evaporate, and you continue to evaporate the water off the oceans and then have it collect as snow. Once the snow becomes a certain depth, the depth of the snow will begin to force the bottom of the snowpack to begin to solidify into ice. And if it gets deep enough, the bottom of that ice pack will begin to melt, not because of temperature, but because of pressure. And when the bottom of the ice pack begins to melt, it begins to move, the ice moves. That's a glacier. Continental glaciers moved from north to south. And as they did so, the most significant um, and final push was about 16,000 years ago where the glaciers pushed all the way through New England. We're talking glaciers between one and two miles deep. They pushed all the way and as they pushed their way south, the bottom would melt, a little bit of water would seep into the cracks of the bedrock, and then it would, well, it would basically, it was freezing cold, but it would, once it got into the cracks, because it was melting under pressure, it would refreeze because it was no longer under pressure. It would crack the rock and begin to pluck material out of the, out of the um, bedrock and clean, and it was ripping things off the bedrock and cleaning things out. And as it did that, it collected all that material, pushing it down, almost like a plow, all the way down to what is now Long Island Sound, and it dropped all that material in what makes up Long Island and Martha's Vineyard Nantucket, creating a huge pile of debris down there. Well, about 16,000 years ago, after you know this end moraine dropped that debris at the end of the glacier, the glacier began to retreat. So the end of our glacial period is beginning now, and it's retreating. As it retreated, it backed its way up. And if you look at the map to the left, it backed its way all the way up to a place called Rock Hill, Connecticut, 
where it dumped a tremendous amount of debris in what was the valley, creating a dam. And that Rocky Hill Dam ended up being a place for water to get backed up behind as the glacier retreated, moving its way further and further north. Water collected in the valley behind the dam, creating a huge lake, you know, a hundred, couple hundred miles long, a lake called Lake Hitchcock, which ran all the way from Rocky Hill almost up to the Canadian border. A huge, huge lake that was created. Um, and the image over to the right kind of shows um, in the Amherst Northampton area, what the glacier looked like as, as it was moving away. Kind of fun to see, you know, what those images look like. And, the, and the, very quickly, the other images are just some of the evidence that we had the glaciers come through. Um, the sand and gravel pits that we have that run up and along the Connecticut River Valley, those are because of the glaciers and the meltwater that came off glaciers and, and sorted the rocks in that way. The image to the lower right-hand corner is an image of uh, varved clays, which is deposition that would have happened annually. You have you know, water that would, would have um, sediment that would be deposited each fall and winter that would be very, would be very like a very dark clay. And then during the summertime, it was a very light colored, you know, mixed sediment. And it would kind of make layers of dark and light, dark and light, showing annual deposition in the Connecticut River Valley at the bottom of what was late, this lake. This created a clay base for the entire lake. And all of this is going to make sense as we kind of move. <laughs> so we've got a clay base in the lake. And if we move on now. Um, that's, uh, that's what, so we have the clay base in the lake, and then, you know, we're going to now have from about 13,000 years ago up until today, and this is a picture from today of the Oxbow in Northampton. Actually, one of my students took this picture. I was flying and she was taking pictures. Um, I didn't do both. It's not safe that way. The, the lake is, the lake would have existed, um, and then what happened is the, um, as the ice melted back, the lake was existing. Once the ice was gone from the land, it was like um, it's like sitting on a mattress. If you sit on a mattress, it pushes the mattress down. When you get off the mattress, the mattress comes back up. The same thing happened with the land. The land, as soon as the ice was removed, the land lifted back up. In the north, where there was lots of ice, it lifted up a lot. And in the south, where there's a little ice, it lifted up a little, and it tilted the land. And then the water began to kind of seep around that dam in Rocky Hill, Connecticut, emptying out the lake until the last remaining piece of water was the Connecticut River that we know today. And it continues in pretty much the same place that it was once the glaciers were removed from the area. And this particular oxbow that you see here, um, this meander, a cutoff meander, if we go to the next slide. Oh, nope. See, this is where you go back in time, you can see all the images and you kind of get the sense that, wow, time really flies, literally, and flies overhead too. It's like, the, it continues to fly overhead. Okay. Well, in short, you know, I'll, I'll you know, if we can continue through the slides, I think we just can get to the, yep, yeah, we'll just kind of go through. So, we'll, yep, yep, keep going, keep going, yep, keep going. We're just going to slowly go through these, maybe five seconds each. One, one, two, three, four, five, just to get a sense. And then the next one. These are looking at the Connecticut River Valley from north to south today. Next. And next. And next. This one takes longer to read. Oh, well. And next. I like the Memorial Bridge and there was... And next. And I hope what you notice that's most obvious as you're going from north to south is the river gets wider and wider and wider and wider and wider still. The mountains become reduced. The river gets wider. It has a larger floodplains. The point that I'm trying to make is that because of the way the, the valley was structured by the rifting, first by the mountain building, then subsequently the rifting created the valley, and then the glaciers cleaned it out, leaving a clay base. And then when Lake Hitchcock was in place, plants began to come back into the valley. The ice was gone. Remember, when the ice sheets were over us, there was no life here. When the ice sheets are removed, it ends up allowing plants to come back in. And when the plants began to grow, 
there were no humans living in this area. So we had lots of plants and they would grow and die and grow and die. And as it would rain, the organic material would be collected down to the valley for literally thousands of years, thousands of years of organic material being brought down into the valley. And as it would be brought down, it's brought down into the river. The river would have annual flooding cycles. It would bring that organic material and it'd be put up onto the land again and again and again, creating one of the most fertile valleys in the entire world because of the way it was structured and because of the absence of human impact over a huge amount of time, an important period of time in terms of the development of the valley itself as we see it today. Um, the next slide. So just a couple quick things, you know, much, I just thought it was important that you kind of look at, you know, we actually have, we have much more forested land than we did 150 years ago. I mean, we really do. We have 77% is forested. Um, there also, I just wanted to be, point out, there are 65 major dams on the mainstream of the Connecticut River and its tributaries. That's huge. Um, and then please, the next slide. And I just threw some numbers up here that I pulled off of some data that I have at the college. I thought it's just fascinating to see what the kind of the temperatures are in this area. Just the difference between the structures that make up the mountains and the structure that makes the valley. So the mountain building events that are responsible for those external structures and then the, you know, basically the, the events that created the valley and the differences. I mean, just look at the winter temperature alone, 19 degrees on average in the hills and, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire and 28 degrees in the valley. Springtime, 41, 44. Summer, 65, 68. Fall, 47, 52. And lastly, annual, you know, there's a five degree temperature difference. And then the precipitation, not amazing um, in terms of difference, pretty much the same. But if you go to the next slide, it does speak to come of the snowfall. And I think that this is kind of impressive when you look at it. So there's a couple things here. One is the amount of snow in the valleys on average about 45 inches versus 80 in the mountains. The length, the length of spring is nine weeks in the valley, five weeks in the mountains. Fall, nine weeks in the, in the valley, six weeks you know, in the mountains. The number of days below 32, just look at that number. I and mean, this is what is critical to our about 26 days under 32 in the valley, 180 days in the mountains. Days per year with temperature below zero, you know, not as significant, but then the average length of frost-free days, think about farming. I mean, we have 185 in the valley and only 120 in the mountains or further to the north. Again, most of this is because of the elevation in the structures. Um, next. So a few quick takeaways. Um, deforestation happened between 1836 and 1900. Um, we have more forest land now than we did 150 years ago. Um, one question is, how do we continue that trend? Um, today, we have 65 major dams along the Connecticut. You know, how do you balance safety, sustainability, and ecosystems? Huge questions. And lastly, 200 million years ago, the climate here was quite different, and the trigger events were different. We know the trigger events were plate tectonics. Um, today, we have different trigger events, and it's impacting things in a very different way. The temperatures and rainfall data that I brought forward to you was pre-1950, and that was on purpose to give a sense of what the climate was before more, more significant impacts have changed that. And I think that's it. Thank you so much, Fred. It's not every day you can go 280 billion years in 40 minutes. So <laughs> congratulations and thank you for that. Um, we're going to segue to um, hear Kathy bring us a little more present day and what's happening at CRC. Great. Thank you so much, Fred. That's really interesting. And it's, you know, as you were talking, I'm, it was realizing that so much of our work is really at the interface of geologic changes and human impacts. And when you add into that now climate change, right? A lot of the content of what we do as an organization ends up um, working with the interplay of those things. So I'm going to provide just a couple examples of our work that sort of, you know, comes out of an understanding of um, really the substrate and what Fred was explaining about you know the history of geologic change in the Connecticut River Valley. So this image here. Um, is 
uh, the same spot on a brook called the Whetstone Brook in Brattleboro. And this is upstream about, uh, I think, six to eight miles upstream of the Vernon Dam. And so the Vernon Dam, um, over the years, right now, one of the projects we're working on is re the relicensing of the Vernon Bellows Falls and Wilder Dams. And in this case, the Vernon Dam, when it was built in at the turn of the century, actually raised the river level by 30 feet. And so you're looking at that same arch on the left was before the dam was built and on the right um, more recently where, where the water level. And this is a tributary of the Connecticut River. So just as you get through that arch, you are the, the Whetstone Brook is entering the Connecticut River. It's right at the confluence really. And so I, I wanted to include this to show that, you know, as, um, Fred was talking about sort of the triggering events, some of kind of a smaller scale triggering events that are causing changes in our watershed are some of these human induced impacts. In this case, the example of actually increasing the level of the Connecticut River with um, the addition of hydroelectric dams and then even increasing those dams over the course of the past you know, 100, 200 years. One of the things that that, occur, that occurs as a result of that is if they make any changes to how water flows through the system, that triggers new erosional processes. So in our hydroelectric relicensing effort right now, this is one of the things that we're focusing on. Um, the, the projects up here in Vermont are going to be are proposing an operational change which is gonna change how the water flows through the systems. And we anticipate because of all of the sort of glacial, you know, sediment and the type of soils we have along the river that the erosion, the erosion, erosion, sorry, that's gonna occur over the coming 20 years after this license change could be quite um, unpredictable and sediment is gonna move through the river uh, in a way that it hasn't in 40 to 80 years because they're changing the, the operations. Stacey, if you could go to the next slide. So just to kind of illustrate that a little bit, this is the mouth of the West River in Brattleboro at a point when the hydroelectric facility had to drop the surface water. They had to drain um, the what's called the pool behind the Vernon Dam, which meant they dropped the elevation level of the Connecticut. And you can see here, these are mud flats where the West River, as it hits the Connecticut, has dropped all of its sediment. This is not a kind of natural cobbly bottom of the mouth of the tributary. If the Connecticut had been moving all these years, this is really a result of that dam being in place, which is forcing the water to drop its sediment as it hits the Connecticut River. Next slide. Um, one of the other impacts, this is one of the riverbanks in Claremont, New Hampshire, um, in the Connecticut River. And what you're seeing here is, in this case, because of the operation of the dams, they have been changing the surface water elevation of the river from three to five feet every day for more than 40 years. Um, and that up and down of the surface water elevation has been pulling some of the fines and the silt out of the riverbanks and sort of causing a, like a, a more intensive erosional process in that area of the river. This is occurring really because of what has been put in place from this kind of geologic time scale, right? And so as glacial H Hitchcock drained, we have these types of like fine sediments and good farmland along the Connecticut River. They're also susceptible to erosion that comes from our, our human induced choices. Next slide. Um, so add to that climate change, right? And so this is a graph showing um, the changes in uh, precipitation in the Northeast between 1895 and now. And what is generally happening in the Northeast is there is um, increases in precipitation coming in the form of rain decreases in precipitation from snow, which means we will have a smaller snowpack, which means we have more water running off our landscape into our rivers. 
before climate change, you had this cycle where it would snow, at least um, where I am up in Vermont, New Hampshire, right? The snow is really sitting on the land. It's staying frozen all winter. And then you have a slow, you know, um, melting of that through the months of March and April and into May. And then you have this huge freshet where the where the rivers are flowing really high because all of the snow is being melted. As we enter more and more into our changed climate, what we're seeing more and more is a cycle of rain and snow where you don't get that same kind of snowpack. You get a rain that comes along in winter that sort of washes a lot of that snow away. That's causing flooding in a lot of our rivers. Um, you may get another snow, but you don't get the dense snowpack. And that snowpack in its more natural state was feeding and um, you know seeping into restore groundwater. So we're simultaneously getting flooding occurring and drought conditions. And so you might have in August or in the summertime, much more droughty years. And then um, in the winter and spring, much more wet years. So the extremes because of climate change are starting to impact um, literally how the water is flowing off the land and what that means for what is happening in our rivers and in our communities. Next slide. So I wanted to share this. Um, one of the things most recently this last summer, I think, you know, in July, a lot of our communities up and down the river really got hammered by some pretty intense storms that were that came after a wet season, right? So there's a lot of water in the ground already. And then when you get hit with a heavy storm, that water has nowhere to go. This image is from the Vermont, um, essentially, it's like a landslide atlas has, that has been looking at these um, mass failures or large, larger landslides from these more intense storms. Go ahead to the next slide, Stacey. And I'm showing an example here. This is on the Windhall River up in Vermont. This mass failure actually occurred during Tropical Storm Irene. So this is not new. This is around 10 years old now. And what you're seeing is the slow regeneration of plants on that, you know, essentially like a failed slope or a landslide. And that is starting to kind of heal itself. But so when you have floods, when you have the sort of the intensity of what's coming with our climate change, the rivers will be needing to readjust, readjust. And rivers are always trying to find equilibrium, right? So they pick up sediment, they erode, they drop the sediment when they slow down. Um, depending on the velocity and the volume of water, that sediment can be huge boulders or it can be, you know, fine grained sand, right? So um, this, as we're entering into climate change, you could almost think of this as, as one of possibly the next geologic trigger, triggers because it's really strongly affecting our landscape um, and, and how rivers are interacting with our landscape. Next one. And um, kind of as a result, a result of that or in reaction to that, a, a big part of our work, our restoration work is really focused on trying to create the space for the, these natural processes to play out, right? So we do a lot of work where we identify grant funding to do natural resource restoration projects. This image is not one of our projects. This is uh, also from the town of Brattleboro, but it's a floodplain restoration. And what you can see there on the left is where um, the Whetstone Brook was sort of being channelized and being held in its channel. To the right, there used to be low income senior housing where you see the water on the right. And this project was a floodplain restoration. Um, it was flooded during Tropical Storm Irene. There was a FEMA grant, the housing was taken out, and now the floodplain has been restored in order to enable the Whetstone Brook to come out of the floodplain, spread its water and energy, and reduce potential um, impacts downstream. And so these types of projects are really important as we adapt to our changing climate. Next one. 
And then this is another project we recently worked on. It's a dam removal. Um, and as Fred mentioned, yeah, there are thousands of dams in the watershed. Um, and part of our work has been focused on trying to identify the ones that are no longer being used, the dead, what we call deadbeat dams, um, and taking them out. Because in, in many cases, the presence of a dam increases the flood stage. So the fact that the dam is in the water makes the surface water elevation higher, right? When you add floodwaters to that, you can have floods as a result of that. So this is a, a dam removal project. It's a little hard to see the, the dam standing from the bridge there. If you go to the next picture, Stace, it'll make more sense. That is where the dam is was just taken out. And you can see that big area in the back was a pond that prop that reduced the um, the flood stage of this brook by seven feet. So it's seven more feet where the water can kind of fill up, access the floodplain before it is would have been like overtopping the dam and, and causing a problem. Uh, I think that might be my last picture. Yeah, so just those are sort of some of the examples like geologic, these geologic changes don't ever stop, right? We're living in the midst of them. And so um, a lot of our work, we have to consider and really understand the history of, you know, Glacial Lake Hitchcock and what that means for floodplains, where the where the river can, can flood into and, um, you know, how to adapt to our changing climate. So... We have a couple minutes. There are some great questions in here. Um, and I'll go maybe in reverse order. Suzanne just said, are the 65 dams along the Connecticut River actually producing electricity? No, not all of them. Um, there are many, and off the top of my head, uh, there are many that are producing electricity, some as run of river, some as peaking facilities, and there are many that are just old dams. It used to be a mill dam and like is in the woods, right? Um, uh, Kathy, I'm just going to interject for one moment before you move to the next question. Since we are getting close to the one o'clock hour, just so folks know, uh, we're going to stay on another five or 10 minutes. If you have time to do that, that's wonderful. If not, um, if you want to put your question in the chat, uh, we will uh, attempt to answer the questions and send a follow-up email. And as well, you'll get an email with, with both Fred and Kathy's contact information so you can reach out to them directly after. So thank you. And thank yes. you all for being here if you need to go or uh, go soon. Okay. Well, Keep going. <laughs> I'll start from the top. Bobby asked um, for Fred, can you talk about the flattening of New England and other areas during the Ice Age? What effects did this have and how do we know? That's, that's a great question. So the most significant um, visible impact of the glaciers, again, continental glaciers coming over an area, is the rounding off of the mountains. If you were to look at mountains that have not been impacted by glaciers, they're very sharp and pointed. Um, and they've eroded very sharp points. But in the case of anything that would be north of New York, Long Island Sound in north of us, all of our mountains are, have just been completely rounded. They did take debris off, but the, the glaciers just really round things out. And they round them off in kind of um, in an elongated shape that runs kind of north-south as well. That, that's probably the most best way to address that one. It, it, that's kind of a segue to the next question. Can you also talk about the Hudson and Delaware in relationship to the Connecticut? They all run parallel north to south um, from Lisa. So there were in the in the Hudson and the Champlain Valley, there were other glacial lakes. You know, I spoke of, the, you know, we're focusing on the Connecticut River Valley. So we're focused on Lake Hitchcock. But there was a great Lake Champlain that actually extended well beyond where Champlain is that ran the Hudson Valley. Because the valley was there, the Hudson Valley, which was created by some of the same process that we spoke of earlier, it was also a place where you know water could collect during the glacial you know glacial meltback. So they that's exactly why it's also the reason we have the Great Lakes. Um, the glaciers came through and got backed up, and the Great Lakes formed as part of that same retreat of glaciers. Yeah. 
Um, next is uh, asked to please confirm. This is from M. Kiefer. I understand the Rocky Hill Dam experienced several, maybe five deterioration events, each resulting in successive levels of Lake Hitchcock draining, resulting in several stepped lakeshore terraces visible in Northfield, Mass., and visible also like all up in the watershed in Vermont and, and New Hampshire as well. D um, can you confirm that? It it wasn't, yes. Um, so Rocky Hill was the main dam. It wasn't the only dam, but it was the main dam. And Rocky Hill, um, when the land tilted back up after, you know, iso, you know, isostatic rebound. So when the land tilted back up, instead of a catastrophic event, and I know one of the questions was probably, was it a catastrophic event? And there was a long history of Rocky Hill was catastrophic and it blew out, but there's no evidence of Rocky Hill being blown out, the whole area being destroyed in a, in a flood. What did happen is because the land was slowly, it was gradually moving up north to south, the water seeped around the edges of the Rocky Hill Dam, creating what, what are spillways. There's actually a, a Rocky Hill spillway. And those spillways would let water kind of seep out as the land rose up little by little by little. And subsequent areas that were also dammed up north of Rocky Hill ended up controlling different stages of lake level. So as you go up, you can see terraces all the way up through New England of the different lake levels, depending upon where the drainage. And I think the number was five you had mentioned. I think there were eight um, different drain levels, but there are like three very easy ones to actually find along the along the valley that you can actually see pretty well without with an unaided, unaided eye. You can actually drive along and see where the terraces are pretty clearly. Um, another question about Rocky Hair was really the primary factors that formed the Rocky Hill Dam? So <clears throat> most important was the valley was had split apart and we create the valley was created during that rifting event. And because the valley has mountains on the two sides, it creates a natural place where if you put something there, you can dam it up. And it was it happened that as the glacier was retreating and carrying debris with it, ro the Rocky Hill area was an area where a lot of the moraine material, the material that was collected by the glacier, was deposited in that valley section, which created the dam. So it was the combination of having the valley and having the debris bought, brought by the glacier and having a place where it, it just happened to be, it got stuck because of the way things were flowing at that time and created a natural dam, which we, we see natural dams all over the place along the Connecticut. This is a natural dam on a larger scale because we had materials that were dropped by a, a continental glacier. Mm -hmm. Um, Paul Stedlin points out snowpack loss may also contribute to greater temperature fluctuations as in winter as well. Thanks for adding that. Um, uh, Amy and Dan asked if we can show the photo of the river from northern Vermont again from the first presentation. It was the first or second slide. I think that was the Nulhegan probably. Um, I'm going to just share that we can we can send a PDF of the slides to folks and we should continue on with other questions just to get to as many as we can. And then Mike Callahan asks, wondering about the deeper mechanics of how continents are able to move. Are the continents shallow, composed only of crust that float on cores of molten rock? That's a that's a wonderful question. So the short answer is yes. Um, the crust ranges in depths of you know a couple maybe a mile or so to you know multiple miles but it's relative to the you know the the entire depth of the earth which is in the thousands you know the tens of thousands of miles it's it is a very very thin section and because it because it does and it does float on what's called the mantle so the crustal crustal areas floating on the mantle and the layer between the the term for the layer kind of at the bottom of the crust is the asthenosphere which is just to the, you know, just above the mantle. And it's the heat energy from the inner part of the earth moving the mantle through convection that ends up driving, um, you know, heat into, you know, very strong amounts of heat into certain parts of the crustal area. Some of them such that it actually creates this conveyor belt, which is the mid-Atlantic Ridge, the conveyor belting of kind of the land moving apart. Other areas, the land moves together and sometimes it, and it gets subducted. So we get some areas that, so you don't, there's no win or loss. I mean, you're losing some, you're gaining some, but there's a net zero loss of land, but you lose some of the land this way and you gain more where it's coming up over here. 
Um, Paul asked, to what extent has the erosion and sedimentation diminished the dam basin and effectiveness of the dams? Um, I can say, you know, there's different kinds of dams, Paul, as you know, since you're USGS, but uh, we also have, I think, 16 Army Corps flood control dams that were built in the watershed. Um, after the 1927 and 1936 floods, really, it, you know, up here where I live is to protect Hartford, Connecticut, because, you know, that city was essentially built in a wetland. Um, some of those, depending on how they were structured, how they were built, um, many of them, you know, the Townsend Dam is an example, has almost fully silted in. So, yes, in a lot of cases, some of the ability to control floods has been reduced as silt has filled in behind the dams. Um, not all dams are the same. You have dams that are run of river hydroelectric dams where the river is moving over them all the time and they're moving sediment all the time. Um, so kind of depends on the dam. I don't know, Fred, if you want to add anything to that. No, I think that's fair. I mean, I, I, it's funny. I look at the um, at Smith College, they have a dam um, that helps them to create Paradise Pond. And to see the work that they do all the time to clear the silt out and the buildup that is behind that dam is just, it, it's an amazing project just to keep a small pond that's a couple acres in size. Um, and knowing that that happens in much more, you know, significant ways up the river, um, it, 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 it's just amazing the kind of work that's necessary. Um, Sipper J is asking, she can make a comment and show a mineral specimen from upstate New York. I'm thinking maybe we'll try to just hop through the last few comments here and then we can do that at the end. Would that be all right? Sure. Okay. Um, John just said we should give a plug for the Glacial Lake Hitchcock, which was named after Amherst College Professor Hitchcock, who identified the glacial lake that had been formed. I just um, very well said, and, and the um, and Louis, Louis Agassiz from Harvard was the person that named it for Hitchcock, um, because Hitchcock didn't quite understand the idea of you know continental glaciers, but Agassiz had done work in Switzerland and was able to kind of take all of Hitchcock's work and translate it into something and then name it for him. Yeah. And John Mudge also um, mentions that uh, he lives above the Bellows Falls Dam and has three surveys from his land um, where he can document the loss of 40 feet of land since the Wilder Dam was built um, with his earliest survey being in 1962. And uh, I think the last question I have here is at what point did volcanic rocks get deposited? When when the area was being pulled apart, you know, I, I never had mentioned that. I, I I apologize. When the land was being stretched apart locally in, you know, kind of the, from like Turner's Falls south to New Jersey, as the land was being pulled apart, the underlying mantle seeped through the crack as lava and flowed onto the surface about 190 million years ago. Um, not as volcanoes in this area at that time, but as large, what it's called, it's called a rift valley. And it was just large flows of lava, like six, 700 feet of lava would flow out onto the surface and cover the surface in, very flat. Today, if you were to travel, you know, through the Amherst Northampton area um, or Greenfield area, that that same lava is now what is Mount Tom and the Holyoke Range and the Pocumtic Range. All that it's kind of, it was flat originally and was tilted up because of some movements within the earth. And it's, you know, they're now ridges that you can see, but that would have been the lava that would have entered the system. It's also the, the, um, the lava is what allows us to get a, a more accurate uh, date as to when the events occurred, because we can do radiometric dating of igneous material like lava. Um, let's see, we have one more question come in. How does increased erosion affect the mouth of the river? <laughs> you know, I think it depends at the mouth. It, it's pretty, the river is controlled much through the whole system. So, um, you don't get the same kind of erosion and kind of, I think like a river Delta that you would get if the dams weren't there. Um, 
there are images, you know, we have a great image we use in some of our slideshows after Tropical Storm Irene, where you can see a very clear sediment plume coming right out of the mouth of the Connecticut into the Long Island Sound. Um, so I think, you know, as you get into the lower part of the river, there's, because of the size of it, there's just more sediment movement and things that then enter into the Long Island Sound. It's a pretty natural process. Uh, I don't know, Fred, if you want to add something to that. The only thing I'd add is, you know, as I tried to kind of demonstrate in the images, as you went from the north to south in terms of our flow, again, remember, not all rivers flow north to south. Um, they flow up and down. <laughs> um, but as you get further downstream, um, the, the valley widens. Um, and the area where it's, you know, kind of depositing in, you know, Connecticut and into Long Island Sound, it's it's incredibly wide. You know, the estuary is wide and you've got both, you know, the salt water and the fresh water mixing and your environment is very, very, very different. And there's much more space for that deposition to occur and spread it out. So it's um, it has the ability to absorb, not to mention you have the ocean, you know, currents that end up pulling things away. So you don't see it. It's not as obvious um, what might be left over at the very end because it just isn't there anymore it's been moved yeah i think should we go ahead and sipper can you um make your comment and share yeah yeah so uh, i'm a big mineral collector and to uh, further say, state a little bit more what fred said about uh, having evidence that there's a shallow sea in upstate new york um there's these crystals uh called herkimer diamonds and <laughs> yeah. these are found in vugs that are created uh, in the limestone as a result of um, stromatolites, are, they're like a big underwater cabbage. They range from anywhere from like a foot to like six feet, 10 feet. And as these things died, they were covered with, um, they were all carbon. They were they were covered with um, limestone and dolomite and quartz seeped into these uh, cavities. Once these cavities, uh, once the stromatolites um, died, it was nothing but pure carbon. Um, you can see that right there, that's ethraxolite. It's pure carbon. It's a result of um, the stromatolites uh, being uh, decomposed and those voids were formed. And then these crystals, they're 500 million years old. It coincides with the ancient sea. So I wanted to bring that to your guys' attention. Um, a very famous place, Herkimer diamonds, naturally occurring crystals, double terminated. I'll, I'll just add, I'm just going to add very quickly to, to your, your Herkimer diamonds and the stromatolite. Just for folks that have not heard stromatolite before, it's a sedimentary structure. But more importantly, it's microbial uh, blue-green algae, you know, microbial mats that actually are responsible for the air that we breathe today. They, they're, they're, the, they're the little critters that oxygenated everything that we have today in terms of oxygen. Um, had we not had stromat stromatolites and those blue green algae, we, we wouldn't have you know air at all. And there's some beautiful in Upper State New York has got beautiful you know examples of that. I'm sorry, I didn't want to. Do, I just wanted to make sure we kind of knew what the what the you hear stromatolites kind of a strange term. Uh, let's see what's that. Um, Bruce said he recently heard a podcast about how there was almost no river banks before uh, colonial intervention. The rivers were full of beaver dams. So, yeah, I would say our landscape has changed <laughs> dramatically. Um, and, you know, even as you because of the fact that we have low lying farmland along rivers, that's where we've developed our communities and where we've built roads. Um, so that opportunity where you would have beavers essentially creating wetlands, damming tributaries, right? And, and you'd have a much more dynamic like wetland floodplain river uh, interface. We've lost a lot of that. I think the statistic in Vermont is we've lost something like 30% of our uh, initial um, wetlands. And as we enter into this period of climate change with more precipitation and more flooding, you know, would would be really great to have them back <laughs> to sort of absorb some of the floods. I'm going to jump in here and say that I think it's time to close out. There are so many great questions, and I'm sure there's many more. And just encourage folks to stay in touch and ask your questions via email or we'll share phone numbers as well. I, I thank all of you for coming out and sticking sticking around with us for so long, and especially Fred, what a wonderful presentation, and Kathy for all the adjoining more present day connections. 
This has been really, really interesting and exciting. Um, we hope that you'll join us for our other live streams. They're happening once a month uh, through June, and they'll be posted on our events calendar. And like I said, you'll get the link and lots of resources you can follow up with. And a little sneak preview, we're hoping to schedule um, a live uh, boat ride with Dr. Richard Little in the Northfield, Massachusetts area over the summer to do some, you know, hands-on looking at armored mud balls and uh, stay tuned for what, what the heck those are in another time. <laughs> so thanks again to everyone for joining and uh, have a wonderful afternoon.